Hey, this is Brian Crescenti, and uh, I'm here at Play NYC speaking with Jacob Navok of uh, Gen Genvid for a, a talk called The Future of Live Streaming Will Be About the Viewers. Uh, so Jacob is the co-founder and CEO of Genvid um, and has a lot of history in, in working on interactive streaming technology, uh, which is what Gen, what is sort of uh, Genvid's bread and butter. Um, Jacob, could you explain a little bit what that means? What is Genvid and how did it come about? Sure. So the actual origin story for Genvid comes from cloud gaming um, and from the evil corporation from Final Fantasy VII, Shinra. So uh, <laughs> the team at Genvid is the team that built Shinra Technologies, Square Enix's cloud gaming subsidiary. Uh, myself, I worked at Square Enix leading worldwide business development and strategy for their CEO uh, for many years, for most of last decade. And I also built Shinra for them, which was a cloud gaming company that we announced in 2014. Uh, most of our early employees and all of our co-founders at Genvid come from having worked on cloud gaming from 2009, 10 through to 2016 at Square Enix for years. Uh, but the focus on Genvid is not to play games over the cloud. It is to enable new experiences for people to watch and interact through cloud streaming on, say, Twitch or YouTube, in the future, other platforms. Yeah, I, and that's, I guess, the interesting thing. Uh, people know, every, I think everybody in the game industry realizes that interactivity, local interactivity is a big deal, obviously. But interactivity online is uh, a huge deal. Uh, live streaming is a huge deal. Um, I think one of the numbers that you all shared with me was that it's 20 billion hours of viewing per year now for a game, game live streams, which is an insane amount of people watching people play games. Um, and it sounds like what you all were doing was looking at that and seeing that there is something that can be added to that experience. So that right now you have essentially people who play games people who play games and stream games and people who watch people playing games, but there's not sort of this crossover very often of people who are watching the streaming and can interact with it. That's right. And I think that part of the reason that this is the case is that the majority of interactivity and the way in which games have developed up until now have primarily focused on the idea of somebody's playing and someone else is watching a person who's playing a streamer, for example, right? Um, Generally, the people who are interacting with the streamer are interacting them through chat or talking with them, and the streamer is a performer. But what inspired our company, what we worked on, is stuff like Twitch Plays Pokemon, where a million people interacted with a game simultaneously. There wasn't even a streamer involved. And we're interested in what kind of content formats can erupt from this. We call them miles, massive interactive live events. And so the projects that we work on and the type of content we help facilitate really move toward interactivity and exciting engagements for viewers. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's interesting. Um, I know we're going to get into it and you're going to show some good, great examples, but I would love to hear sort of on a basic level, how is what Genvid doing different than something like Pokemon, uh, or I'm sorry, Twitch plays Pokemon Go or Pokemon? The way in which we think about it is Twitch Plays Pokemon was a format of content, whereas what we do is provide tools for game developers to create new types of content for it. Twitch Plays Pokemon, you had Pokemon in an existing game that viewership was controlling, but it was meant for a single person to play at the end of the day. We're interested in helping game developers, content creators, even sports and media broadcasters, and we can speak about that later, generate mass-scaled interactivity and do so with content that's built from it from the ground up. And if you're interested, I can show you some of that. Yeah, so you have a couple of games um, and it sounds like there's different ways this works. So what's the first game you wanna show us? Why don't we start by taking a look at Counter-Strike because that's a game that everybody knows. Right. And it's an easy way to understand how interactivity can, uh, can really make something enjoyable. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and we will make sure that this is working just fine. There we go. You able to see Counter-Strike? Yes, yes. Perfect. So you're actually looking at a twitch.tv stream right now. Uh, there's no difference from this and any other twitch.tv stream except for everything that you see is fully interactive. There's no installation, no setup. I've installed nothing. 
um, in my browser, and it's really just my Chrome browser that this is working on. And we've run this interactive suite with Twitch for the last year and a half now, and almost every major and final they've had for CSGO. Now, one of the things that is interesting here is that uh, everything that you see on the screen is interactive UI, uh, and it's updated at 60 FPS at almost um, um, synchronized to frame. And the data that you see here is captured by and, and built through a partner that we have called Statelix, who has all of these amazing tools for CSGO that our tech helps synchronize to video with. Um, the only video that is being sent to Twitch is this. Everything else is coming through the Statelix system and synchronized and made interactive via Genvid. And the first time a user gets access to this, they get a tutorial it says, welcome to the command center. Would you like to learn more about the features? And right. you can click on show me. And it'll actually start to teach you how to interact with the video. Now, we had to do this because when we first did the broadcast in 2018, we found people weren't clicking enough because it looked so native to video that they didn't realize they could interact with it. So you begin by teaching people. Why don't you try tapping on this map? And you'll notice that it reacts to me. When I click it, it changes size. By tap on a player, I can see their statistics and information updated in real time with the Statselix data set. I can cheer for viewers, which I'll see in a moment, but I can even open up, for example, a real-time mini-map and see mouse cursor movement, player position, firing of weapons, et cetera, all wow. synchronized from the Statselix data through Genvid to the Twitch video that I'm watching. And I can tap on a player and cheer for them and turn them on fire, which you can see here. And you'll notice that the player is on fire here. And we can do paid cheers or we can do free cheers for free. And all of that is scaled to every viewer who's watching. You can turn it off or turn it back on as they so prefer. Uh, and, and, and again, and this ahead. is not like, this isn't going to affect the gameplay. So if you're a player, you won't see any of this. Unless we want to make it available to them. Now in professional competitions, you don't want to distract. But I'm going to show you more products where it's all about interacting with the people who are playing and with the game itself. Right. In CSGO, in a professional tournament, we don't want to do that until after the fact. So you could create, for example, cheer rewards where after the match ends, the players can see uh, who got the most amount of cheers, who scored the highest points, and it can become part of a sponsorship package as we so prefer. Right, right. Okay. The other thing I want to point out here is the crosshair. Players take a lot of time to customize their crosshair. It's red for me right now. But in this settings menu, which looks like CSGO settings menu, I can go ahead and change that to green and change the size. And it's adjusted for me as an individual viewer. When he loads up a sniper rifle, it'll disappear because sniper rifles have different crosshairs. And what's happening is every frame of video is actually contextually accurate to the overlay that's happening on top of it. I know what's occurring inside of the game, inside of the game engine, and I'm making sure that it's accurate to what it is that I'm watching. Now, I'm watching this from one player perspective, but I can put up a completely different player perspective. And this goes back to the benefit of being on the cloud. Since we are a cloud-based streaming system, I'm not dependent upon the player's specific streams. I can generate any POV, POV that I want. I can generate and watch any player's perspective that I want to generate. And in the live tournaments, we'll do all of the player streams and interactive stream plus the main broadcast channel you'll be able to engage and change them as you like as an individual viewer. Wow. And you said currently this is something that's, that's out there and live. When we work on the, uh, the tournaments and, and the uh, CSGO majors, yes. It's not something that we make available to individual streamers, so that could change in the future. But for now, it is an event-based system. That's amazing. So um, go you, ahead. You, you hit this when we were starting the CSGO discussion, but you know, you were pointing out, well, you're not affecting the player. Right. So what happens when you do want to affect the player? If you're interested in seeing that content, I'm happy to show it. Yeah. So this is, again, what we saw right now was essentially a way to uh, make the viewing experience a little more exciting for the players, but they can't actually do something to the people playing the game. Correct. So let's take a look at something where they can't. Uh, this is Retroit from Black Block Games in Finland. Okay. In this game, which is in development right now, the players are playing on their mobile devices. So they've got their phone, which you can see right here. 
Um, and playing cars, controlling cars in different missions, similar to the car missions from Grand Theft Auto. It's all in one shared world. It's incredibly cool. It's a lot of fun, free to play. Um, and the viewers, and you can see again, I'm here live on Twitch, are not players, and there's no streamer here. The viewers have a completely different perspective. We are watching the live news channel that's powered through Gendered, and we are able to affect change and impact what's happening to the players. This traffic map is interactive. The breaking news is being generated by what's happening in this shared world. We can go ahead and switch cameras to different parts of the world. So I'm watching it from a specific intersection here and do things like send in a pinata. Now the pinata has explosives in it. And when a player drives into it, it will not go well for them. But you can see the earliest senses of now we're starting to affect, impact, and change the world. We can send in a soccer ball and let them play soccer, or we can do one of my favorite things, which is the cash truck. And when we spawn the cash truck, the players who hit it get 10 bucks, except for if they are the last player to hit it, in which case it will not go well for them. Uh, you can see it's a boom. On the and again, you're not, you're not like controlling this truck right now? We're just spawning, engaging, and interacting with it now. If we wanted to allow the viewers to control the truck, we could do that too. It's really up to the developer to choose how deep right. an engagement they want to provide to the viewership. I see. So again, just to clarify and make sure everybody understands, this channel that we're watching is not tuned to a specific player. It's actually the game. So you're right. watching this game. You can interact with the game, but you're not watching streamer A play the game. You're just watching the entire game from sort of an overview. Precisely. We have our own channels. We're watching the news channel and the developer BlackBlock is working on their next phase of this that will include things like the finance channel and the shopping channel. And you'll be able to acquire okay. items in the shopping channel and spawn them into the world and see the results in the news channels. So you can start to see we're kind of like the the audience watching and affecting. We feel like we're part of the world, but we're not players. We have completely asymmetrical opportunities to engage with the content itself. Wow. Now this is, how far along is this in development? Is this something that's been in development for a while? They've been in development now about a year, year plus, um, and they're aiming for early release next year. Okay. About a year from now. Very cool. I have a couple of other projects that I can show you if you're interested. Yes, we absolutely. Either, we can either take a look at the latest title from Dennis Biak and uh, his his game Dead House Sonata, or we can look at Project Eleusis, a brand new project built from the ground up for interactive streaming. Your choice. Okay. Let's. This is interactive. Uh, interactive interviewing. Um, <laughs> how about the uh, the brand new project, Pro uh, Project Elusive? Is that what you said it was? Yes, Project Elusive. This is from Elusive Pipe Studio in Eugene, Oregon, uh, and they're well known for having created Super Fight and Terraria and lots of other amazing games. Uh, and so here on Project Elusive, what's interesting is there is no player. No one can play this game. You cannot download it from Steam or download it onto your mobile device. It exists only as a stream. And the AI characters that you see here are not players. They're kind of like NPCs going around their own journey. We can tap and interact with them. We can see Hurley's needs and goals, bio, social profile, status, and inventory. Wow. And you'll notice that it looks like I'm interacting with it like a video game. I, everything is reacting to me. and adjust right. to my needs, but I'm just one viewer watching this channel and there could be a million others. And if we wanted to impact the AI and change them and affect them, the developer thought of this like an interactive version of the TV show Lost. I can select a drone delivery, open up the GOAT and activate the drone. Now I'll compete with other viewers. In the case of this demo, they're mock viewers for what should appear there. Hopefully the goat wins. I've got eight votes, 10 votes for the goat, 11. There we go. You'll notice that the drone pad is lit up and in a couple of seconds, a drone is gonna fly in from the sky and deliver this goat. There he goes, they're gonna eat it and it didn't go well for them. <laughs> the goat was filled with nitro. I'm very sorry, AI characters. But you can imagine Thursdays at eight o'clock, this interactive television show begins and what the viewers decide, whether they sense floating goats or cat plasma batons or 
hatchets or what have you become the storyline. It is not choose your own adventure. It is a collective storytelling experience decided in real time by the audience. So, so is, is in your mind, what is it, do you think the audience, is there uh, an objective they have? Is it just to sort of be entertained or are they trying to get this group of uh, AI characters to do something? The developers called it the Hunger Games meets the Sims. So in the Sims, you're the god and here you're competing with a million other gods for what will happen to your characters. At the end of the day, you're collectively deciding that storyline. And what we think will happen is that viewers will congregate together from Reddit to Twitch to other places to decide, whoa, that was getting pretty brutal, um, decide what's gonna happen in the storyline. So you can imagine the underground lab appears. How do we get into it? Do we send exploding goats? Do we send <laughs> shovels or something else? The storyline changes depending on what we collectively try to do. And we wanna see the end of that storyline. This is about where interactive narrative and television and collective experiences go. Wow. That's, uh, and again, like when this thing launches, I assume it's going to launch like on Twitch somewhere as a channel. It's being launched by one of the major live streaming platforms. Uh, okay. It will come out later this year and we're very excited for it, but I can't reveal more information yet. But the, the point being, it'll be on a streaming platform. Again, you won't download anything. You'll just go there like you're going to watch a stream, but you'll be able to interact with the stream by clicking directly on it. You got it. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Very now, cool. These are all AI, right? And they look kind of cartoonish today. Uh, but you've seen what Epic and other platforms are working on in terms of realistic rendered humans and real-time interaction. These characters could look like real people in a couple of years with really intelligent AI behind it. You might start, you know, noticing things that look like television, but are in fact completely done in a game engine. Uh, and resemble real people, but actually are fictional characters. So where this is all going in five to 10 years is very exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting take on something like The Sims where your impact, I guess, yeah, it's a good example of calling it something like The Sims meets uh, Hunger Games or like a, a God Sim where you can drop things down uh, uh, like some, one of Molyneux's games, and hopefully they do what you want them to do, but you don't have any direct control over it. Exactly. You got it. Um, I want to show one other uh, project that's being built that I think uh, people will enjoy. And uh, this is from Dennis Giak, who's the creator of Legacy of Cain and Eternal Darkness and Too Human. And this is his new game, uh, Dead House Sonata. So I'm going to start by briefly showing you some of what the uh, visuals of the game look like as a player. So over here, we can see the player's screen. They're uh, streaming a traditional roguelike looking experience. And the viewers have a completely different perspective. You see, we're controlling the dungeon itself. We're the collective dungeon masters. Okay. And you can see these enemies here. I can open up this gate let them through, I can turn on the fire trap, and I can collect <laughs> coins, which are gonna let me do upgrades inside of the world. So increasing the dungeon, there we go, some coins. Um, and so I've, I've just made changes, activated pull traps, et cetera, through it. And I'm controlling one dungeon, but this is just one part of the map. They have plans for a, a larger shared world, similar to an MMO, where different dungeon masters will be controlling different factions and affecting the world in which you go through. So you could be as a player going through one part of the world and end up in another one and a different faction of viewers could be in control of this land. And so, and so, and like in this game, it sounds like what you have are players who would be playing a traditional, from their perspective, a traditional RPG or ARPG, but then a viewer will come in and actually essentially be playing a different sort of game with the same characters. You got it. We, we're creating a completely asymmetrical dungeon slash roguelike experience, right? You, you have people who are playing, they're the players of their game, and we've got viewers who are actors and agents changing and affecting. In some of the versions of this that they have coming next year, you'll even be able to uh, impact the voices of the NPCs. It's really interesting where they're taking, taking the project. 
Um, so we're, we're very excited by the way in which this developer is deciding to push the opportunities and technologies of interactive streaming. Uh, it, it's funny because it sounds almost like there's been a lot of discussion about how AI in game development can take over some of the menial tasks of doing things like cleaning up um, capture, motion capture, or figuring out routing. But this sounds like what you're doing is actually having he, real people replace some elements of AI. Yes. In, in many ways, the, the crowd itself is replacing what you know, prior had been the computer decisions or the NPC decisions or the AI decisions. And we're enabling you as the viewer to have a say or a decision in that. And I think where it eventually goes is versions of American Ninja Warrior, where even real people are jumping through hoops and you're changing and adjusting the speed and modifying it in real time. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty amazing. So th these demos are, um, it's easy to look at some of these. Some of them, it's very clear what the difference is, but it would be great if you could explain, going back to that example, we talked a little bit about it, but how on a technological uh, perspective, how is this different than something like what we're already seeing on, uh, on Twitch right now, where games are sort of have interactive elements? The, the primary difference is that we're enabling cloud scale spectatorship. In other words, I'm not providing tools for streamers right now. Um, in fact, most of the projects that you've seen a streamer cannot download. We're there to help scale experiences from cloud streams to hundreds of thousands or millions of concurrents. So the project that you've seen, there are games residing on the cloud, not on somebody's local machine. We're encoding and capturing that video. We're synchronizing it to a very high perspective. And we're making sure that the viewership can interact and engage with it. So it's pretty different than a Hyperscape or a Darwin project where you're just interacting with an individual streamer. We've built up all of these cloud tools coming from our experiences from Shimra that will allow these things to run 24 seven and enable you to play and control that. The other major difference is that we're not tied to Twitch. So when you build with Genvid, you can write once and deploy that to Twitch, to YouTube, We've announced that we're gonna be supporting Tencent's streaming platform, Huya in China, later this year, and a couple of other platforms that we're aiming for as well, including your own proprietary platform. So if you wanna create your own application or generate your own streaming app or web portal, you can go ahead and do that with Genvid. What, so uh, going talking about the technology, is it essentially serves as a plugin to, to different uh, engines, is that right? That's right. So we have plugins for Unreal Engine and Unity. And in fact, you saw Unity being used in Project Lucis, but we also have integrations across different engines. So you saw four different engines today. Uh, CSGO is Source, Project Lucis was Unity, Retroit, the car game, is the Godot engine, and Dennis's title is Lumberyard. Uh, and so in every case, um, they're using our native engine integration guide in a couple of hours to get things up and running, regardless of what the engine that you choose. And in some cases, like some of the sports projects that we're working on, there is no engine. So, uh, and I want to, I definitely want to talk about where things are headed, but just kind of talking a little bit about these games, what uh, some of them, like CSGO is obviously uh, something you're taking an existing game and adding something to it. The others are all, all the others that we looked at, were those built from the ground up for this technology or when was the technology injected into it? Generally at the design slash alpha phase of it. And okay. that's where we like to be there. We prefer working where the developer is really thought about how can we create amazing experiences for viewers from the ground up? And we recognize that content development takes years. So in some cases, projects that we've been working on started in 17 or 18 and may not release until 2021 or 2022. But we're there throughout the different stages of the developer life cycle. And we're assisting not just in development of the technology, but also co-development of the web experience. We help facilitate with design. We've got data that shows how users like to interact with it. And if you need deployment or live operations, our teams will be there too. So uh, just um, before we get into where this is all headed, I'd love to just kind of go through some of the really basic things. I know you talked a little bit about it, but when someone is watching this live stream, 
uh, especially one of the ones that we've seen, like uh, Dead House Sonata, for instance, what is actually happening in sort of in, in, uh, basic terms? What is it that's going on behind the scenes? It's a great question. So uh, let's imagine that we've got a situation where there are people who play the game, um, because in some cases there are no players, like Project Eleusis is AI. Right. Um, the players are collect connecting to a multiplayer server that's controlling and uh, managing all the data between them. We have a spectator deployed version of the game that is watching those matches and resides in the cloud on let's say an AWS server. And so we're re-rendering the game from a completely different version of it. We're not dependent upon your playing or my playing of it. And we can change the camera angle freely in at will. From within the spectator enabled version, we have uh, the GenVid SDK that is capturing audio, video, and data and exporting it in real time. We send the audio and the video to Twitch and we send the data through GenVid WebSockets to the viewer's browser in an overlay. And so we connect three different things at the same time, game engine, cloud streaming, and web technologies, because all the clicks that you saw were done through the browser in HTML5. And those three combined together create the GenVid experience that you see. So when somebody uh, is playing this game or when a game is being designed, um, how, how customizable will you allow developers to make these experiences? Will, will, is it sort of completely open to what they want to do? The SDK itself is completely open, but what we try to do is educate and shepherd developers in the design process to think about things that are, one, feasible for delivery. Right? Not every idea um, will work well, uh, and by that I mean, cost scalable, engine feasible, or works even from a, a internet protocol perspective. Like I, I can't go faster than light and it's also not cloud gaming. So right. you're not literally controlling camera as an individual viewer in these cases. Um, the second thing that we try to do is give them data and expertise on what viewers have liked to engage with based off of existing products that have used us. So we know that viewers love cheering, they love tribalism, we know that they love to do voting. We know that they love to collect things like the coins that you've seen. And we also know some things that they don't like to do, which is they're not necessarily interested in becoming players of the game. Um, a lot of people misunderstand this. They see the promise of the cloud gaming platforms and they think people who are watching want to play. Actually, most people who are watching Twitch or YouTube stream just want to watch they don't necessarily want to be players or they would be playing the game. They want to be entertained. Um, and so there is a very frequent and common mistake that streamers want to invite players to play alongside them. Actually, the majority of popular streamers are afraid of that. That's called stream sniping. And they right. don't really <laughs> right. like that. They right. go to deep uh, ends to avoid that. Um, and so we, we want to teach the developers that a viewer is not necessarily uh, a player and vice versa. And that leads to point number three, which is we want to help them monetize the viewers. So there's a common misunderstanding that the primary audience is the players and therefore viewer interactivity is a marketing function. And so you'll see people connected to battle passes or in-game items. Right, right. But all that does is increase your potential player revenue base. I'm interested in enabling a developer to generate revenue from people who aren't players, who are viewers, who are entertained by the content itself. And you see that over and over in the products that you see. I may not be a player. I may not own any of the games that you just watched. But I may enjoy the act of interacting so much that I want to monetize it through clapping, through cheering, through dropping right. items in. Yeah, and so that, that's interesting because I, I historically, currently, there's no direct monetization for a, a game that's being viewed. So I, in other words, a developer might make money because a player sees someone playing a game and they go out and buy the game, right. or they might like the skin they see in a game or something like that. But there's no, if you're just viewing, there's no way to monetize that viewing experience. 
Yes, precisely. And if you do try to monetize it, you're generally just monetizing a streamer stream rather than the content itself. Like after right. the cuts of Twitch and the streamers, you're getting a very small percentage and it's not particularly meaningful. What we want to do is help facilitate the kind of microtransactions that you would be getting through your traditional free to play game on PC or mobile, but do so for this much larger viewership audience, including the creation of skins or hats or other items and the ability to engage and drop things in for a dollar that creates enticing and engaging content. The way I, I've thought about this for years now is I love watching games done quick streams. And right. I really love the Super Metroid streams at the end for the save the animals, kill the animals donation frenzy. So at the end of Met Super Metroid, you have, you know, that the choice, should the streamer save those animals during that last 10 minute section where uh, the plant's exploding or should they kill them? And there's this mass frenzy of people donating one way or the other. Uh, and uh, I, I wanna create that excitement for content and, and enable viewers to choose and decide how they want to engage and get excited with it and affect it in such a way that the content is actually impacted by it and the developer can monetize that in a new fashion. Uh, I think that that kind of content will come, but it's also really, really important that game developers consider who their audience is. And I'll illustrate with an example. A couple of months ago, I was talking with a developer of a game that wanted to create submissions for viewers. Their idea was that they were gonna give access to submissions to the streamers. And I said to them, well, that would create a problem because the majority of streams only have zero to two viewers. And then a couple of them have tens of thousands. And what's fun for zero to two viewers to interact with in a submission, and what's fun for 10,000 viewers to interact with in a submission, not necessarily the same. And if you try to merge that, you get a lot of the kind of not interesting stuff that you're seeing with some of these streamer oriented titles now where it's like, let's change them to moon boots, right? Or now you can do a thing that was already going to happen, but you press the button. So um, if you try to split the difference, it doesn't really result in exciting new experiences. Right. right. Um, and so they said, okay, we understand. So why don't we create some submissions that work for zero to two viewers and some submissions that work for 10,000? And I said, well, now you've just stratified your player base because you have content that you can only access if you're a super popular streamer. Right. People will be very, very upset by this. And the reason that the logic worked in their head was that for them, they're trying to increase their player base, right? But if you think about it, not from the perspective of creating marketing for players, but from the perspective of entertaining viewers, your decision matrix looks very different. And so, for example, let's say that the objective is to get 10,000 viewers to engage with your content. You can get that through 10,000 streamers that have 10 viewers each, or 10 streamers that get 10,000 viewers each. Which one do you design for? Right. Well, if you're player oriented, you design for the 10,000 streamers that have 10 viewers each, right? But the viewership on the larger streams is more engaged and more excited and frankly easier to design for, but they're not going to design a product for five popular streamers. Right. right? <laughs> no, well, not on purpose, at least. Not right. on purpose, exactly. And so this becomes the logical flaw when you think about the opportunity as a marketing opportunity rather than as an opportunity to engage viewers because if your opportunity is to monetize and engage viewership you will always go for how can i increase the number of viewers not can i how can i increase the number of players and that's the kind of tide that we're trying to help push back uh, and enable developers to realize as an opportunity do you so do you think that i guess two different things first off do you think that players who are playing these sorts of games are open to the idea of the people who watch them play having an impact, a direct impact on their gameplay? I think if you design it right, there's no difference between viewership and any other form of antagonism, which is to say, it's funny, I, I used to have this, this thing with esports. People used to call esports 
competitive gaming. It'd be like all formats of gaming is competitive, whether you're playing against other players, or whether you're playing against an AI, or whether you're playing against, frankly, yourself and how quickly you can do something, you're competing, right? And so what people enjoy, the reason that they love playing games is that form of competition, that game loop that gets created. And so if you go and you say, this is the mode that you're playing, there are going to be 99 other players and one thing that's controlled by mass viewership, it's just a format of game design and whether that's exciting to interact with. It doesn't really matter whether that it's viewers or players or even an AI, but you have to design it in such a way that it makes a meaningful difference. And this gets to my point about moon boots five minutes ago. Right. It can't be so generic that the fact that it was 10,000 people interacting made no difference to you. It has to be meaningful to the product. And then kind of on the flip side, do you think, you know, back in the day, I remember how upset everybody got about horse armor, having <laughs> to pay for that horse armor. Uh, and now you're, you're talking about introducing the ability to pay to clap for your favorite gamer. So like how, how much pushback do you think there's going to be uh, to that idea of monetizing? As long as you don't lock gameplay behind it, which is the point on submissions, I don't think that it's an issue. I think that viewers are a little bit different than players. And uh, I'll illustrate through one thing that gamers really hate, in my opinion, which is in-game ads. You're right. If you paid 60 bucks for a game, you don't want to see ads in your game. Even if it adds some immersion, like you're in a racing game, it's an actual ad for product as opposed to a fake one. So you paid 60 bucks for a thing. You're watching on YouTube, you're watching on Twitch, you see ads everywhere because you're used to viewer content being monetized that way. You understand that these things need to generate income somehow. And so I think that the mindset of a viewer is very different than the mindset of a player. And what we have to think about is, is this engaging in a good format for people who are watching to interact with? And can we do it in such a way where we don't offend our player base? And I think that that line can be walked pretty easy. So do you, I mean, you've, you've demonstrated today some examples of this, but how will this impact, this technology impact the sort of games that are actually made? Is it going to change the sort of games we start to see? I think of the game industry like geological strata. And it was my former boss, Wadasan, who first came up with this chart. It was interesting because the, the chart um, that, uh, he designed, it was originally like 2005 shareholder letter, and then he had me updated around 2010. And what it shows is arcades and then consoles and then mobile devices and then free-to-play PC, they don't eat each other. They exist as markets together with each other. And so the game industry doesn't shift, it expands. And you see these markets sit on top of each other like the strata of the earth. Uh, and I think that viewership is a new opportunity that will radically increase the size of opportunity for developers, but that doesn't replace traditional game making. I think that similar to how mobile didn't replace console games, some developers will decide we want to create our game for viewers, and some developers will simply decide we're going to make a game for iPhones, or we're going to decide to make a game for Xbox, and they live alongside with each other. But we've primarily up until now thought that viewership is a marketing component. I'm going to make my game for Xbox and I'm going to add some streamer tool to it. And that's going to be the way in which I do my game design. And I, I'm arguing that no, this is a new product that we should be thinking about the opportunity for massive interactive live events as actually the true form of cloud gaming because it's about interacting with a stream and that stream itself is content. And is that, is that, uh, if this is a new genre, is that what the new genre is? Massive interactive live events? Is that what you... That's exactly it. Yeah. I think that if you look at the history of content, a hundred years ago, you have the onset of television, film, uh, passive media, right? Starting the 1920s, the first real talkies and film, starting in the 50s, home television, and then you start to see fully interactive and immersive content, video games, starting in the 70s. Um, the average American today watches five and a half hours of television 
of which an hour is immersive Game of Thrones, I'm paying attention. The remaining four to four and a half hours is I'm cooking, I'm cleaning, it's on in the side. But meanwhile, interactive content like games is immersive and demands your attention, right? You cannot move forward in Call of Duty unless you push the joystick. It won't fire a weapon until you pull the trigger. You cannot crush candy in Candy Crush unless you <laughs> tap on the phone, right? right? The content waits for you. And so what I'm interested in is, can we create a format of content that is about interactivity, but that isn't reliant upon your immersion, that exists similar to that remaining four hours of television, which is not Game of Thrones. Like, what is that stuff that people leave on the background? Reality shows, cooking shows, right, sports, right. frankly. Just like background right. noise, basically. Background noise. And so yeah. can I go and switch between things and engage? I'm watching a thing and I'm just like, I want to mess with this. Oh, what's happening here? I'll watch it for a few minutes and I'll send a goat in or I'll send in a plasma baton. I'll see an interaction. I'll get a feedback loop. I'll enjoy it. But I don't need to focus on it or be immersed in it. I don't need right. to be skilled at it to enjoy it. And I think that that's what unlocks what the cloud gaming companies thought that cloud gaming would unlock. And I'm happy to explain what I mean here in a moment about a new audience. Um, but I think that um, creating more games for people who are play doesn't change or unlock an audience. It just is not an extension of your traditional audience. Yeah. And so the idea, I mean, obviously Twitch to some degree fills that gap, but it doesn't allow you to go. I think you said this when we were speaking before the idea of, leaning back or leaning forward, um, Twitch doesn't allow you to, to go from one to the other. It's just right. like television. You know, and, there's no and, interaction really. Yes, exactly. And Twitch itself is a platform. It's a canvas. The content that you see could be on Twitch, could be on YouTube, could be on completely other apps, but the platform itself is not oriented toward that right now. It's oriented toward you having an interaction with a personality, right? right. A streamer, right. not necessarily with content itself. Uh, I think that will eventually change. Uh, and I'm excited for that change. But I think that comes from a function of content design. And I think about this from the early work that we did on mobile titles at Square Enix, which is to say, when I first joined Square, it was the onset of um, the iPhone and, and mobile gaming. And if you think back to 2008, 9, 10, when the App Store first came out and the original titles that we were putting out on mobile at that time, uh, we were releasing... Final Fantasy 3 for 15 bucks. And now you are just playing the same game you were playing on Super Nintendo, but you were controlling it through touchscreen controls that were not very good at a premium pricing. And right. we've since learned that that is not the way you make a game for mobile, right? The canvas was the same, right? It's a mobile device, but you had to design free to play social titles. And um, we watched, you know, uh, the titles coming from DNA and, and from Gree gung -ho's puzzles and dragons. And we realized we need to completely rethink the way in which to design games for this, right? It's about the way in which you create easy to access casual content. Right. And so in 2012, we started working on Final Fantasy Brigade, which was our first free to play social Final Fantasy for mobile devices. We learned from that, we generated data, we generated internal know-how. And then from there you see Record Keeper and Brave Exvius and other things coming out. But it was a five-year journey to learn how to get there. And now those mobile titles are floating the majority of Square Enix profit if you look at the financials. So, you know, the canvas is going to be the same. It's still Twitch, but the things that we're creating for Twitch right now are created for streamers. And I'm arguing we should be creating content for viewers. So I, I want to talk a bit about where this could head. Uh, I, I think all of this is very fascinating. I think the impact this can have on game development and what sort of games are made is fascinating. But what really interests me right now, especially with everything that's going on in the world, is the notion that you might be able to uh, apply this in some way to something other than video games, to real world stuff. So um, I'll just set it up, but like sports right now has this desperate problem of when they can do live sports, they can't have a live audience. Right. So, I, you know, we've seen some solutions for that, but how does GenVid uh, sort of fit into some of those issues? We've been thinking about how do you create digital spectator experiences for a half decade now? And the primary failure point that we've seen over and over is that 
the broadcast itself is not interactive. The broadcast is linear. And they're forcing you to move to a second screen for that. So if you want to cheer for the NBA during lockdown right now, you're going to your mobile device, your PC, and the broadcast is on your television, right? The same thing with Major League Baseball. And if, if you've interacted with any of those, you're kind of cheering into the ether. Like, it's really weird. Like, you're tapping the thing and it's appearing on your phone, but like, who cares? It's not affecting the broadcast, <laughs> not changing the broadcast. Right. It's making no difference. And so what we want to do and what we've been working on in our proof of concepts is you saw high synchronization to video of data. We want to enable in the broadcast itself on your OTT streams and your television through Roku or Fire TV, on your desktop or especially on your mobile devices because more and more people are watching here. But like you can't switch between your mobile and the interactive app on your phone. You're like double tapping and then going between the cheering and the video. It's very awkward. We want to enable that on broadcast synchronized directly to what it is that you're seeing. And we want to facilitate that back in the stadium so that, for example, if you're cheering, those virtual cutouts that they've been putting in there are actually cheering based off of audience interaction, right? We want to increase the fanfare of things that are happening in stadium, but we want you to do it through the broadcast itself, not through second screen applications. And we want to tie in data elements so that if you want to see player movement or player tracking, if you want to see historical data, it's precise to the frame and it unlocks the moment that you see something and happening exciting in video. I've been watching some of the streams that are coming out of the, the reburns of sports and the video will play 30 seconds behind the data. And so I'm actually being spoiled to the future because I'm seeing free throws <laughs> and I'm seeing, I'm seeing, you know, right. home runs being hit, but they're not happening in video and it's awkward and weird. So is this, would it in, in some way look like what we were seeing with Counter-Strike where you have those overlays? Exactly. Uh, we've been working on that and, and uh, we're very excited for what the next year will bring. The, the real dream is going to happen probably about three, four years from now when some of the work that these places have been doing on putting, for example, 3D arenas and player tracking in the Unreal Engine gets unlocked. And right. we've got full 3D tracking relative to video. So you can like literally click or tap on a player in it and highlight them and change and impact them. That'd be cool. And, and what about the idea of, would you guys play in this field of like putting yourself in the audience or is that something you think that's already been sort of solved? Visually, I don't think I mean. that it's been solved in a highly reinteractive way. So it, it was funny. There was a tweet circulating last weekend um, from one of the major league baseball uh, streams where they they had the virtual crowd and the crowd was several seconds delayed to what happened so like right. the guy swings the bat hits it and the audience like this and now he's running and then they're going like this and that, that <laughs> kind of delay and lack of sync is just awkward and weird right so I don't think that it's been solved I think that the uncanny valley of what interactivity should be is real which is why we focus so deeply on the level of synchronization that we work on Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for uh, having this discussion. This was uh, fascinating, and I really look forward to what you all are, are going to be doing over the next couple of years. Thank you so much, and, and appreciate the Play NYC audience listening to this. Um, a couple of our other developers, uh, including studios that have used Genvid, are, are presenting this week, and so you'll be able to see other games that I didn't show as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks for watching. Thank you. Take care. Hi all, we have one more bonus demo for you. This is Chicken Arena from Catapult Studios. And this is a really fun game where the kids can create their own creatures called chickens and the audience can vote on which chicken should appear and help feed them and also clap for them, cheer for them, get information on their special moves, rally toward them, etc. cetera. Uh, so here I'm gonna feed one of these chicken creatures and then from there, we're going to vote for which one should appear next. We'll vote for the majestic feather cat. And uh, we're not in control of the chickens directly. We are the audience who is there helping, clapping, cheering for them in real time. The developer of this game is actually speaking in a different session at Play NYC. So I hope you get a chance to see their video. Uh, and they did a really great job with this live stream, which can have streamer hosts who are uh, calling the shots alongside the creatures themselves. 
And the audience, of course, can go pretty deep into it. So you can see the statistics and information on all of the different weapons. But you can have a lot of fun just clapping for the chicken, sending those claps in. Uh, and then when one of them gets attacked and needs to defend, there are going to be rally moments between the audience in real time. So you can imagine you know, kids creating their creatures, sending them into the live stream, having all their friends come vote for them. Uh, and then enabling them to interact and clap and cheer as though they're the audience of chickens in the background there. So I, I hope you got a chance to see this other project that's using Genvix Tech uh, and also get a chance to hear from the developer themselves later this week at Play NYC. Take care.